the next little thing. It goes to a third party provider. I got, this shocked me. Do you know Americans are packing classes on how to survive active shooters? They had a class up in Amarillo. Amarillo, guys. You don't think much about that. They had over 600 people show up. Look where we are. Now, last time we had this, we had about 60 people show up. So I'm very proud that we have turned out tonight since this is our second one. But we're going to continue on, okay? Um, reading on about the Amarillo, their city has been infiltrated with Muslims. They're scared. They're very scared. Um, Muslims infiltration. Then Beaumont. Hillary Clinton had an election event down there, right? Six people showed up. But before she got there, she had a meeting with a group of Muslims. If y'all don't know, right outside of Houston is a large encampment. As we stand with our nation in trouble, and I forgot to say this, I was fixing to read over to Mark. Let me back up. You guys, Franklin Graham is going to be in Austin April the 26th. Be on the south steps between the hours of 12 and 1. So I'm going to get that in and not forget that, I apologize. But I do want to turn this over to Mark because our country is in trouble. And we do need to know how to protect ourselves, our families, and our homes. Mr. Mark, I'll let you do it. <laughs> I am working on my daily food pyramid. I can get two of my three food groups with caffeine and sugar from this. <laughs> Chocolate. My name is Mark Wilder. I'm constable here in Precinct 3, which is really right across the street from here. It takes in uh, the basic borders, uh, goes all the way to Leon Valley, uh, the east part of Leon Valley. Um, Bandera Road goes up, takes in the Lotus and the areas, the new areas that are west of Lotus comes east all the way back around to IH 35, goes down south to uh, basically Loop 410, and then we take in Alamo Heights, Almost Park, and Terrell Hills right across the street over here. All that's Precinct 3, it's about 293 uh, square miles and about 534,000 people. Uh, we've been teaching, uh, well, actually, the, the way we got to this class on the active shooter was we had a lot of calls in January asking what the new changes would be for open carry and we had about 230 inquiries about what our policy would be as a law enforcement agency towards that so we sent our policy out along with the law updates to everybody who asked and then of course that came about to well how does that change what might happen if we were involved in an active shooter situation well then we took it a step further we brought you some materials out here today and we've handed you out a little flyer uh, let me borrow one from you that small fire just for a second. I love it. By the way, you're not expected in an emergency to grab this microscopic piece of print and look from underneath your position of cover and read what it says. Uh, run, hide, and fight. We're going to talk about that. The same thing that's in the material in the larger print. Uh, and the run, hide, and fight is something that we do all the time as far as this training goes. But we stopped reading and going along in the book about second or third grade. So what we're going to try to do is we'll shift a lot to what you can do, what are the levels of awareness that you need to be maintaining, what kind of things should you be looking for as far as just noticeable difference in behavior in people, uh, what might be a red flag that you may be walking into a situation that might become an active shooter. And we also want to define what an active shooter is and also put it in perspective as to what you may face and what type of frequency that it's occurring. It is occurring more often than it did in the past, and we'll talk about that, but keep in mind it's still a rare thing in the United States. We are also a tough nut to crack in Texas. Texas is not like California. Uh, we are a gun culture. 
which actually serves us and it serves us fairly well. Uh, when I get into the part about fight, uh, most everybody's ready for the fight. And we're going to talk about what we can do, both armed and unarmed, in a situation where we are involved in an active shooter situation. And first of all, we're going to talk about trying to avoid those situations. But the fact is, we have 860,000 plus people uh, that are licensed to carry, and that's growing. And uh, we were just calculating that out. It'll be about 118 adults over the age of 21 who are eligible. So odds are, in this room, we have a fairly good representation. Uh, my pastor was very worried that open carry would become a real problem in church. You're not technically supposed to carry in church, but I told them every day in our traditional, which is like 230 people, I guarantee you there's 20 people that are carrying it here. And it's not going to be a problem. And he goes, well, I wasn't even sure if I recognized somebody carrying a gun. And I was helping that day in uh, serving communion, and I was wearing a dress shirt, and I was wearing an inside shoulder rig inside that shirt that says, I'm carrying. And he looked, he tried to figure out where, and I said, you're not going to see it. Somebody who knows how to conceal carry, you're just not going to see it. Now, if you want to touch it right here, you'll find it. Uh, we have nice little curves and indentations in the human body, perfect places to conceal weapons. Uh, now, when we talk about the active shooter, we got to contrast to that with what we would have normally as far as uh, be a hostage type situation where somebody takes people hostage. Let's say we're at Chase Bank today and somebody trips the alarm and this guy gets trapped. This particular person takes hostages, might threaten to kill people, but odds are they're not really. They came to that bank with the intent of making quick cash and they, made, they intended to leave alive. The active shooter is the exact opposite. This person comes to a confined area with the sole purpose of killing as many people as possible and then they intend, probably by their own hand, to end their lives or have the police end their lives for them when they finish what they've been doing. We talk about this, this particular course, and we talk to, and the argument quite a bit has been when I'm talking to school administrators or other people in government, uh, it is not a first responder course. I am not teaching police, fire, and EMS. The first responders are you. You are the citizens, because guess what? The first response, this kind of a situation on the active shooter is overworked before police can respond effectively. Not that they won't respond, it's just that in the time period that it happens, it's too late. Uh, we talk about in the literature, it's 10 to 15 minutes. There are active shooter situations that have lasted three, four, well, six hours. The shooters in uh, San Bernardino, there was a long delay in that. Columbine was actually a fairly long uh, time frame in 1999, I believe it was. Uh, so they can last longer, but in most cases, three to five minutes are over with. And if you haven't taken steps to protect yourself by either running and avoiding the situation, finding a place to hide, or fighting back, which is the addition that we put into it, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, you will become one of those chalk outlines uh, that you see on TV all the time, and people will be taking photographs and having memorials about you. Uh, we take that kind of responsibility in Texas of our own safety. And so this is not a big transition for a lot of folks in Texas. It would be in a lot of other areas, uh, such as California or other places that have much tighter gun restrictions. One thing I can tell you is on institutional shootings or in shootings that have occurred in the last 12 years, the vast majority of them, probably better than 85% worldwide, are in gun-free zones and advertised as such. I think the Archdiocese of San Antonio put out this past Sunday in their bulletins that they basically were publishing the 06 and the 07 rules against weapons on church property. Uh, that's not actually effective according to the law, but uh, that's their intent. Uh, going back to Columbine, that was a pivotal change in law enforcement and how we responded to those kind of things. Uh, in Columbine, uh, that was a typical shooting back then, they responded. There was a school resource officer at, on the scene there who actually got involved in a gunfight with the individuals within about eight minutes. Uh, but the rest of the officers did what they were trained to do, which was establish a perimeter, contain it. Nobody got in, nobody got out. But the problem with the active shooter, we have one major enemy. What is that enemy? Time. Time. The longer you wait, the more people die. Uh, I put on a presentation for a private school a couple days ago. They have a campus of about 65 acres. Uh, they have 650 souls on that, uh, and they were talking about how they were going to handle the active shooter on a situation, and I was briefing their upper echelons, and they were talking about arming their coach, and he would go and have a weapon in a gun box, and if there's an event on campus, he would go get it. So I said, well, let's talk about that for a second. So every time I clap my hand, that's somebody dying. 
And I'd say, what are you gonna, how long is it gonna take you to get your gun? Well, it, it's in the office. Go get it, how long will it take? Two minutes. You have a pause, he's reloading, he's firing again. On your way back, he sees you and he shoots you. Who's gonna replace you? I'm carrying 60 rounds of ammunition, which means I can fire that 60 rounds of ammunition in a very short time period. Same thing as, of course, we talked to them briefly about their emergency plan, and uh, we recommended them that they actually have 18 school marshals, one in every block of classroom, so that they respond within about eight seconds, and every person had to carry that weapon, not seek out and find it later on. So that's the difference in law enforcement's response. Now the law enforcement response to the active shooter has changed. Now it's very simple. Find out where the shooting's coming from, find the shooter, kill the shooter. And if it's one officer that responds, they don't wait. That's one of the few times we don't wait for backup. We will go in with one person. If there are two officers, three officers, we may make entry with two or three officers. But we can't afford to wait, and neither can you, because unfortunately, in the type of situations that occur, it happens quickly, and we'll talk about several of them. We'll talk about the Aurora, Colorado theater shooting, uh, and I have some audio to give you some idea of the confusion that happens, uh, and the types of things that are faced by everybody who's out there who's a victim. And you're a victim whether you're shot or not. Uh, the average adult in America hasn't been involved in a violent confrontation as an adult. We may have been involved in fist fight or something like that as kids, but as an adult, we're a very civil society. We hardly ever resolve things with violence. There are some people that do, uh, but the vast majority of people do not. So we're going to talk about the uh, avoid, run, talk about hiding, and we're going to talk about fighting. And we're going to go into, when we talk about that, those aren't necessarily the order that things occur in in real world. In other words, if we are in a movie theater here right now, uh, if we had typical movie theater, we have 10 theaters on one side, 10 theaters on the other side, we have the food court in the middle. Uh, if we had warning, and for example, we were hearing gunfire outside and people were saying there's three guys with guns shooting uh, coming from that area, we actually have the opportunity to run. Now, how many people noticed the entrances and exits to this particular room? One of the things we talk about awareness is we want you to start looking at your environment. It's not much different than what we teach you about other violent crimes. It's not much different than what we ask you to do when you're going up to a standalone ATM. You want to look around and make sure that somebody's not hanging around, watching your, or observing your movements. You know, when you're going out to your car in a parking lot, you're the last one going out to the parking lot, you're scanning to see if somebody's standing near the car. You've got your car ready, already unlocked when you get to it. Uh, you're ready to hit that panic button in case somebody approaches you so you at least have that alarm going off and the lights flashing. Uh, so we're, basically we're trying to teach you to up your awareness level to things that just aren't quite right. Now, in, uh, I know that he's going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. We have a psychological term and in training we call it J&D, just noticeable difference. It happens in animals and it happens in people. Uh, by that, if someone walks into this room right now, coming in for the meeting late, what would they probably do? Most likely, with our culture, they're going to make eye contact so the least possible path of interruption will be maybe say, excuse me, but he's gonna, he or she is going to make eye contact with most everybody here. That's almost a given in our society. If somebody walks in and is not looking at anybody, makes their way all the way to the very back behind everybody else, I guarantee you the hairs on the back here and we standing up. Why is this person avoiding eye contact? Usually that indicates something's not quite right, doesn't it? Uh, if you saw three people dressed the same in black camouflage, or just black shirts, black pants, watch caps, and with heavy jackets on, and walking favoring one side or the other on their arm, and when they walk, they're like they're standing in a weapon underneath their jacket, maybe a shotgun that's cut off, or a rifle, short rail rifle, or walking stiff-legged, because they may have a shotgun or a long gun down their pant leg, and they can't break that knee joint when they're walking, and you saw three people like that, you're going to be aware and you're going to know that something else is going wrong somewhere. And we're going to talk about movie theaters, we're going to talk about school, talk about HEB, talk about whether you're a church or a synagogue. It makes no difference where you're at. We're going to raise that level of awareness and be looking for a possible threat. We're looking for the entrances and exits, the intended entrance and exits. We also have other exits in this room. If we were trapped in this area, let's say this back, uh, the uh, back door didn't exist. And we were in a theater, and for some reason, they had, uh, if this was a meeting room somewhere, we still have other exits we can use. We can smash the glass and get out the windows. Uh, there's other alternatives. In a movie theater, 
you can use the two exits up front. They're always kind of hidden behind the curtains, and it's got little red fire signs above it that say exits, which is where the Colorado shooter gained entrance and exit. But oddly enough, he had bought a ticket. He came in with everybody else in that particular theater. During the, uh, the theater, he did something that was unusual. Nobody picked up on it. He went behind that curtain, went outside, opened that, propped the door open. He had to park his car out there. Came back in with a ballistic helmet on, like the police wear, a load-bearing vest, black, a gas mask, and he came back in and had a seat back where he was seated in the theater. And nobody thought that was a bad idea. Why? It was a showing of the Batman movie. There were a lot of people in costume, and a lot of people were theorizing that maybe this was part of a publicity stunt, and nobody gave him a second thought. About 20 minutes after that, he went outside and came back in with a Mossberg shotgun, a uh, AR-15 platform weapon, and a Glock, and also brought in smoke or tear gas. It's not clear yet. They haven't, they haven't still published that report fully as to what it was. Odds are it was smoke, and he popped smoke. He was wearing a gas mask, and then he started doing his shooting. One shooter, police were on the scene in about a minute, 30 seconds, injured or killed 82 people. 12 were killed, the balance were injured. First officers on the scene actually thought he might have been a tactical officer because he looked like a tactical officer at the back door before finally somebody identified him as the shooter. Now this particular guy falls in the category of, uh, I would call him two groups generally we speak that we talk about in the active shooter uh, scenario. One are pathological, which are the nuts, and then we have the ideological, somebody because you have the wrong belief system are coming after you because you need to be exterminated. And we'll talk a little bit about where we can find them and what particular danger we are in San Antonio. Uh, keeping in mind that we're the largest major city to the border. Uh, we have 11 million folks that are in this country already. I'm not too concerned about them. I'd like to see it change. But as far as a threat goes, we have another 500,000 that overstay their visas every year. And we have hundreds, if not thousands, of people on student visas that are supposed to be at UTSA or at SAC or one of our community colleges that have never checked in for a day of school, and we have no idea where they're at. Uh, I think from our last statistics, Texas is number one on refugee resettlement, and we've been number one for years. San Antonio is the third largest city that receives refugees. When I'm talking refugees, we are talking primarily Muslims, Syrians, uh, and our border is seeing an increase of Syrian, Chinese, and other than Mexican uh, folks coming in on the southern border. Our borders are wide open nowadays, wherever you have to be at. So the active shooter, let's go back a little bit and talk about the avoidance portion of it. If this is a theater, and this works, uh, we'll talk about it at HEB too, one of the things we're going to do if we hear that gunfire coming, our first opportunity is we're going to try to get out of here. If there is an emergency exit in the back, we're going to take it. If we're in a movie theater, uh, you want to pick which exit you want to take. You want to take the exit that is least likely to be a secondary ambush. In Columbine, these kids, if you want to call them that, they, they knew enough about the system, and most institutional shootings are from somebody who is part of that institution. It'll either be staff or students, and they know the emergency procedures, as these kids in Columbine did. I think they had a particular beef against the uh, athletic teams, the jocks. Uh, they came in, and their intent was to drive people out of the school in the protected hallways and drive them out into the parking lot. In the parking lots, they had pre-positioned uh, improvised explosive devices. They actually had 99 improvised explosive devices, none of them very well prepared. But they knew the evacuation procedures. People would gather by class out in those parking lots, and that's where they had these devices planted in cars out there. And their secondary plan was to use that as a killing field out in the open where they could fire on them from inside this, the school. Didn't work out quite that way, although they still managed to kill or I think they killed about 18 people and wounded another 40. Uh, that's even with a school resource officer on scene who actually engaged them in a brief gun battle before he retreated. So our first option is to run and get away from the situation. We can do that if we hear that gunfire from far enough away. Uh, and then when I talk about taking the least uh, likely exit for a secondary ambush, in a movie theater, those two little exits up front or in the front of the theater, those usually exit to the dark side or back side of the uh, theater where the trash cans are at and that kind of thing. That's my suggestion is to take that exit there. Uh, I plan every time I go somewhere 
to take a little look tactically at where I'm at. Uh, if I'm seated in the Santicos Theater, I pick my seats because I happen to like that option. Uh, in the smaller theater, there's one entrance. There's about a seven-foot drop uh, from the top. I'm, at, I'm in the O row, which is the uh, row that has no seats in front of it. There's two seats that are kind of orphaned by themselves. And then I have the exit wall, or the walk wall on the side. And we take those two seats, uh, the wife and I, and that's where we sit. And then we watch people beforehand. Our entertainment, to a degree, is kind of watching people come in and we'll go down and she'll go, he's got a gun. And we'll watch him, then we'll see oh, his wife's got one too. You know, we're not too much concerned about that. We're watching for little things like that. Then middle of the movie, my wife will say, remember that guy that came in by himself? Sit down up front, yeah? He just moved. It's been 40 minutes, now he's moved up to up here. And well, it might be that the guy just got tired of looking with his head cranked back in the front row because now he saw that the empty seats were available in the back. But at least she's looking for a possible threat. Uh, if you saw something unusual in that theater uh, that would cause you to evacuate, let's say that three guys come in that are obviously there. Maybe they're dressed alike. Maybe they have something else in common. But what they are not is they don't have popcorn. They don't have drinks. They don't have hot dogs. They're not looking like they're real happy. When they come into the theater, one takes up a position by the front exit. One goes to the highest position on the top and one stays on the lower level. I'd be calling security and I'd probably be leaving to let them know that I see something that's not quite right. If I saw that same behavior at an HEB, I would think robbery. If I saw it at a theater, I'd be thinking active shooter. Uh, perspective. Uh, in 12 years, we've only had 1,100, well, only, we've had 1,100 casualties from the active shooter in the United States. Uh, put that in perspective, we've got 1,800 casualties on Texas highways this year in Texas alone and about 39,000 uh, nationwide. Now there's a big difference between DWI or traffic accident fatality against somebody who's targeting you uh, for either your religious beliefs or they're uh, a pathological individual who's just out to kill people and make a name for himself and be on TV for a short time period. So we're going to try to run if we have that opportunity. We talk about running. If we do this exercise with live fire or with blank fire really or pyrotechnics, even though that you know it's blank fire, and I come into a theater and I fire those rounds, and then I tell it we start to evacuate, there will be people that will freeze and stay in place, and they will duck down behind their seats. They will not move. Uh, we talk about being a little bit selfish when we're talking about the active shooter situation. In that particular case, we're going to bypass those folks and we're leaving them behind. Now, you're not likely to do that with your wife, girlfriend, or your kids. If you're doing it with your wife or girlfriend, that's probably a relationship ender. Um, but if you have people who are in the way, you bypass them and head out the door. We also leave people who cannot move on their own that are wounded, especially if we have a confined area. The active shooter is looking for that mass of people. And that sounds very selfish to leave somebody behind who is wounded. But if, let's say we have four wounded and there's uh, eight people helping that, that person and we have, they're all going to that one exit in that theater. What's that doing to that one exit? We're clogging it up. We're moving slow. And there's another hundred people that are stuck. The average theater may hold three or four hundred people, and the active shooter is sitting in the back, just picking people off, going up and down that line. They don't have to be real accurate, and they're using a 12 gauge shotgun sometimes. Uh, so you're actually losing more people. So in that case, we're talking about being selfish, and we leave the wounded behind. They're probably going to be uh, a continued target, but we're trying to clear out and get out of that area. Now, remember on our first evacuation, the threat is outside the theater, so we're moving out. We've got to talk about what kind of weapons that you might be facing. Uh, we talk about active shooter. We also need to talk about machetes, knives, handguns. The most common weapon used in the active shooter is going to be what? It's a rifle. It's a rifle. Nobody, nobody takes a handgun to a gunfight. You, you bring a rifle. Uh, and a rifle is a weapon that even an amateur or somebody who just picked one up, uh, I guarantee you I can prove that from two years in Iraq. I can hand a rifle to somebody if I've already uh, made it ready to fire and hand it to somebody and say, just look over the top of it, put that on that out outline of the target and pull the trigger. Within about 30 to 50 yards, they'll hit it even without training. Uh, long sight radius makes it a lot easier to do. It takes a little more skill to hang up. So part of our, uh, our factors on our evacuation or our running or hiding is the type of threat weapon that we're going to experience. Uh, talk about which one, if we have a knife, how much damage can a knife cause? It could be fatal in any, particular, any way you want to look at it. And they're being used more and more by people who don't have access to firearms. 
Uh, think what could happen if you have too sharp. Well, when you get cut, have a lot of you have you ever experienced the fact that you've gotten a cut and it takes you a couple of minutes and you go, where is the blood coming from? Then all of a sudden you find out you've been cut. It may be a shallow cut. Uh, you almost don't know that you've been cut. If I walk through a crowded theater or in a crowded football stadium during break and I've had two knives out and I was just going up and down the crowd at a run, how many people could I cut in that time frame? And if I go for necks and upper body, uh, I can create quite a few casualties, I can create quite a mess, I can create a panic. So we have to talk about what's the defense against each one of those weapons so we know what the response is. Now that's why we are differing from the book, because you can read that at your leisure. We want to tell you the practical advice on how to survive these kind of situations. And the defense against a knife is what? Yeah. Distance and intervening objects. If I came in right now with a knife, your best bet would be to toss chairs in my path, create obstacles that I've got to step over, and head out the exits. And then once you get past about 30 feet and run, you've got some distance for you. If you're under 30 feet, I can cover that in about three seconds. Even I can do that in three seconds. Somebody who's really good at it, can, what's, what's the fastest 100 yard dash we got from our athletes nowadays? I'll get it. Eight or nine seconds for a fast check. So we want to get that distance when we're talking about a knife or a machete. Uh, they're not necessarily skilled as far as using the knife. And they're not necessarily skilled in using a handgun. Uh, a lot of these tactics are learned off of video games or watching videos of U.S. soldiers or off of TMs or, or uh, manuals from the uh, different military branches. It's not hard to do. Uh, if you go to most of these video games, you can look at them doing a like bounding overwatch where one person advances and covers, two other provide cover fire, then the others advance. Now, all that's learned in a video game. Uh, that's not something you have to learn out in the streets or in the military services. So when we're trying to evacuate, we're going to leave behind the people who are frozen and will not move. We're going to leave behind property, backpacks, purses, whatever you have. Because you're going to need your hands free in case you have to climb over objects or people in order to make your escape. Uh, or to employ weapons if you have to get down to the point where you have to fight. All these other things can be replaced. Uh, one thing that we do talk about is it's nice to have a tactical edge. If you're there with somebody else, always when you're out, you should have a plan to meet up with somebody later on. In other words, hey, if something goes out, power hits, goes out because of a tornado or some kind of natural disaster, well, I'll meet you at the car. If there's a problem, it's a car. I'll meet you at the Valero. And we'll do that within 30 minutes that we leave the building. That way, even if cell phones are out, you have a way to get reunited with who you came with or your family, and you don't have to spend hours in an area looking for them. You're, you've got that little plan taken care of. So we're leaving behind property and goods. One of the things you can do if you have an active shooter situation like that is and you have two of them, dial 911, tell them, hey, I'm at Theater 9, Santico, Security 1 of Bitters. There's an active shooter. I'm leaving this phone. You can listen in to what's going on and walk away. Take one phone with you. Let the cops listen in on that other phone so they have an idea of what's happening inside there. Keep in mind that when we go for looking for a hiding place, telephones are a good way to get given away. Just like one rings for us right there, <coughs> what you do to hide uh, and what we're going to do to prevent our injury again. We're still in our evacuation stage. Let's say we were at uh, HEB. Uh, where could you go? You have your intended entrances, which is our double doors at the front and the back. gives you two sets of them. And all of a sudden, uh, there's people decide that's going to be the killing zone. Where can you go that are not intended exits that you can go and find safety or an exit from? Stock room. There's multiple stock rooms where they keep the vegetables, where they're doing the, 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 the produce, uh, the dairy, and the uh, meat section. And then they have a, usually a break area in the back where they bring in everything by a truck and the loading docks. So you can head to those areas to get out of the area high. You don't have to stay in the aisles not like the television shows. Uh, and just kind of runs back and forth like the targets in a uh, shooting gallery. Uh, you have a place to go to, but you have to be thinking along those lines. If you're at church, where can you exit to? What, where, what kind of targets will you be in church or synagogue, and where can you exit? What are the intended exits? What are the additional exits? If you're in a uh, business such as a, uh, a large employer, maybe, and you've got two or 300 employees, uh, where are you going to be able to go for safety there? Uh, can you evacuate to another room? Is there a safe area? And we'll talk about what a safe area would be. And that's one that has cover and concealment. And there's a difference. All of our military folks here know what I'm talking about. 
Cover is something, it's a hard material that will stop bullets. <coughs> Cover and concealment. Concealment is completely different. Concealment could be a life, a cardboard box conceals me. If I've got a cardboard box in front of me or I'm in it, but a shooter comes in here, he doesn't see me, he can't shoot me. But if he's paranoid like me, he's going to shoot the box first and then go about business with everybody else. So that box wasn't really a good idea. These tables stacked up against this door or against an entrance provided a heavy barrier, and it's one of the things we talk about when we're going to look at a hide, uh, and also stops, uh, including rifle bullets, having several of these things lined up. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to increase our, our awareness level. We're going to be looking for threats and behavior that's not quite right. We're going to start looking for weapons. Where do people carry weapons? I know we've got concealed carry here. Where are they, where do 99% of the weapons carried on a human body, what area of the body they carry it in? Yep. The hip, around the waist. Either the, the groin, the side, small, small back. back. Uh, it's a real neat shoulder rigs where they can be accessible. We used to carry boot guns a lot in Texas, but guess what? If somebody attacks you with a knife, you look pretty stupid running while trying to get a boot gun out. So people put it where they can get it. Uh, and that's typically where people will put it. Now, what are we carrying? We're carrying the last ditch weapon as far as firearms, if we're carrying a weapon at all. That's a handgun, and that's the last thing you would take to a gunfight if you had a choice. Now, we have a situation where we're going to try to hide. If we don't have an operation, let's say we're in a commercial uh, area, and we have multiple rooms, maybe in a, in a school, uh, and we have a threat that's coming away. And remember we talked earlier that it's not necessarily in the same order we talked about, body beating, running, hiding, or fighting. If somebody walks in with a pistol right now and starts firing, you don't have the option to hide, you don't have the option to run. You have to go straight to fight. We'll talk about that in a little while, uh, about what that fight could be and what it can consist of, whether you're armed or unarmed. Uh, but in our case now, we're looking for a hide. When we're looking for a place to go hide, we're trying to find a place that we're not going to be known. We should have some idea, but keep in mind, if we're in an institution, the attacker probably knows most of these places also. Uh, like when I taught a group this morning, we had about 110 people from a very large, probably 100,000 square foot business area. Uh, and I said that the threat's going to come from one of you seated in here. You know, started looking at each other. <laughs> so when we're going to look for a place to hide, we want to find a way to channel where the bad guy can come with their weapon, try to limit them to one or two doors. If there's more than one door and we're not armed, we're going to block doors or both doors with heavy furniture or other things that's going to prevent them from coming in. And the most important thing is wherever we go for a hide, we don't want to be in a box canyon. You know, there's some great utility rooms and they're steel on all sides and that's where they store all the chairs and furniture, but there's no way out. If they breach that door and when we all go in there, you make sure you turn off televisions, computers, cell phones, or if we have a cell phone go off, now we just let them know where we're at, and we have now let them know where there's 30 or 40 people that are in a box canyon that can be killed. Go to a place that gives you options where you can lock the door, barricade it, and where it gives you additional avenues for escape, either other corridors that you can go out, a balcony, a window. Uh, if you're second or third floor, are you stuck, or can you get out? You can get out. If there's 30 or 40 people in here, we have enough jackets and sweaters to make a rope ladder to where we can get a lot of people out that way. I don't, I, I'm not good at falling 14 feet. At my age, the warranty has expired, I would hurt myself. But I can shimmy down six or eight feet before I let go and I'm not gonna get hurt as bad when I hit the ground. It's better than getting shot. Uh, so if we're gonna go for a hide, we wanna limit the access for the shooters and not limit what we're gonna do as far as our escape routes. Now, in most areas, what are the walls made of? Usually sheetrock. So just because it, it, if you're in a business area uh, or and, it, and it's got sheetrock like an office area, take a heavy object, smash out the sheetrock or kick it out, kick out the other side, now you made a hole into the next room over. If you know your facility, the next room has an access to a fire escape, you kick a hole through that wall, take everybody through there, let the bad guys beat this door down while you're making your escape. And that gives you that opportunity. Now when we talk about a fight, uh, that option could come up at any time. What do you do? And we're going to have to take it down to the basic level that we don't have weapons. Uh, and this is where Texas comes in a little bit differently because uh, we do have weapons. Uh, I actually kind of have to term it slightly differently. If you come into Texas, get into a theater where we have 400 people, 
I'm going to pretty much gather that we got about 50 people in there that are carrying it. And I call that a firing squad. So if we had advance warning that we had a shooter coming in, most tech, now I'll tell you the official, the official view is we only fight when it's to protect your life. In an, and that's the only option you have. You can't flee or hide. But we also know that Texans, adults, teachers aren't going to leave the six-year-olds behind and evacuate the system. I mean, there are several shootings that we have had that involve schools. The teachers actually died trying to protect their students, even if the only thing they had was trying to hit them with a stapler uh, because they weren't allowed to have firearms. And then, of course, what's a six-year-old going to do? They're not any kind of backup. They're just cannon fodder. So when we talk about fighting, think about, number one, what do we have in here that we use for improvi improvised weapons? These are fairly heavy. The tables. Tables, everything else. And if we can channel them into one entry, the flag stands, uh, if you have a place that's a school with the two stands for the U.S. flag and the Texas flag there, those stands are about 22 pounds. They're a great club. The flag pole is a spear. You can unscrew it. Now you have four nightsticks that are about 36 inches long. And you have to make that decision to be able to fight. And the decision is deadly force. And when can you use deadly force in Texas? When your life is threatened. Whenever your life is you, your life is threatened with you're, if you're threatened with death or serious bodily injury, which is kind of an open area, because serious bodily injury could be if I see you coming at me with a three-inch knife, can that kill me? Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, you're probably dead at 30 feet. Uh, people will argue that you shouldn't shoot somebody with a knife at 30 feet. Now, if I had intervening objects and distance between here and there, I have less leap less lethal options, but if I didn't, and this was open space and 30 feet away, I would use deadly force because you can cover that distance way too quickly. Um, yeah, and we've, we've actually done this in court several times, but keep in mind that it takes, if you're really good, it takes between a half a second and three quarters of a second to perceive the threat. And if somebody's in the back and then he decides to bolt at me with a knife, I have to first get the, the message, then I have to respond to it, which is usually an O crap message and then I do what's going to be a typical defensive even if I'm trained I'm probably going to step back I'm going to try to protect my face and head by that time the person could be on me with a knife and if I do get rounds on the person it's not like TV uh, on TV uh, bullets strike uh, bullet fire is, or any kind of gunfire is very accurate or it just misses by a little bit between the bad guy and the good guy in the real world it doesn't happen that way I might fire six shots if I hit him once or twice I'm lucky and people don't drop from a single wound at all. A lot of times it takes multiple hits. And in a, in a knife confrontation, it might just be a matter of who dies last of the winner, which is not a win at all when you look at that kind of engagement. Now, we also talk about what happens if you're facing other than a knife. Uh, remember, we were talking about people who might have a handgun. In the Colorado shooter, he had a Glock, he had a 12 gauge, and he had a uh, AR platform. And whenever he ran out of ammunition for one or he had a problem, he switched to another. It's a pretty impressive body count when you can injure or kill 82 people in that short of a time period. Now that guy did, was an exception because he wasn't intending to die. He had spike strips, he had his car positioned for an escape, he had spike strips in his car that he planned to use to slow the police down if they pursued him. He actually planned to survive that incident. So he's a little bit of an exception to the rule that they usually want to die by their own hand or through somebody, uh, through the police. So we're still going to try to do the same thing. We're going to up our awareness. We're going to be watching people's behavior. We're going to be looking for things that just aren't quite right, just noticeable difference. We're going to be scanning areas for weapons. Uh, and most of the time, we're going to find people all the time that carry guns. And we're going to see that all the time. And we're not going to be too worried about it because we have so many people who are licensed to carry. What if I see three 17-year-olds carrying guns? If we're not hunting or not in a hunting situation, we're going to have a problem, right? We're going to be thinking that there's something wrong. Uh, I saw some uh, last Saturday night in IHOP had a couple of young men come in. They were both wearing hunting knives. Saturday night, out with their girlfriends. They were legal to carry. The blade lengths were. Uh, but would I be concerned about somebody bringing out a four and a half inch blade? I would. I'd be also worried that would be kind of asking for it from somebody else doing the same thing. So run, hide, and fight. Uh, the, the decision to fight is not necessarily going to be yours but you have to be able to respond to it immediately 
because you don't normally have time. If I come in right now and I'm firing a handgun at you, you don't have time to process that. You're going to have to do something quickly. If, even if you are armed, you're not going to be able to respond in that time period to do anything about it. Uh, from the distance we are right now, if I've got a gun on him, he can't draw even if he has a weapon. There's no time, there's no way he can possibly beat me. So we have to go back to unarmed defense, which usually means close the distance immediately, do the best you can to disable them, because they are expecting you to respond as prey. Uh, the prey response is to be fearful, to be submissive, and to be protective. And uh, everybody has a fear of falling, loud noises, and movement or anything around their eyes or their face or their throat. When somebody takes a swing at you and you're not prepared for it, what do people do? Same thing I just did a second ago. They, they duck down, they step back, they bring their hands up in a defensive position. If I'm the one shooting and he turns it around on me by swinging on me and I do this, at least that weapon's pointed up, now he can rush and try to control that gun arm. He can take his elbow, put it in my throat, it's pinned against the wall here, and I, at that point in time I guarantee you some other people are going to come helping. Uh, in Texas, I guarantee you're going to see that. It's a bum rush. Uh, in the Paris shooting, there were three gunmen, uh, two men, one woman, uh, in the discotheque with 171 people who were lined up ready for the slaughter. Not in Texas, I don't think. I think what would happen, bum rush every one of those people and you would not have the slaughter that you would have in Paris. Uh, would somebody get hurt? Yes. Would somebody get killed? Possibly. But it would not be the body counts that we see, uh, what we did see in that particular case. Uh, San Bernardino uh, was a gun-free zone. They had an unarmed security guard there to protect the location. What good does that do? Uh, and that was, that was actually not a planned shooting at that time there. So you've got to be prepared to fight on short notice, and you have to be prepared to use that same amount of force, which is going to be deadly force. I know that when we teach it to you in the uh, license to carry class, we tell you to use that, that amount of force necessary to end the threat. Uh, it, well, that's just a nice way of saying you're probably going to kill them. Uh, I know my county attorney's going, you don't say that word out loud, uh, but that's the real world. Uh, any questions so far what we've been talking about? And we're going to get into, people are going to ask, well, how do we identify ourselves to law enforcement if we decide to use a firearm inside a theater and when somebody else is following in? In our evacuation procedures, whether we're running and we're leaving that location before we've had to engage, we're going to come out, come up with your hands up high, your open, fingers open, nothing including a cell phone should be in your hand. This is a detonator as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and also, from recent times, this could also be a weapon or it could be mistaken for a weapon. Remember, if you get a cop whose energy is up, uh, if you've been in a uh, life-threatening situation before, what happens? Uh, you get very focused on the threat. Uh, you have auditory exclusion. People could be talking to you. You won't even under you will never even acknowledge the fact that they ever talked to you. Uh, and they're focusing on the threat. They've been told there's a shooter inside this theater, and they walk in, in the back, there's a, Mr. Bush is back there, and he's shooting, he's our shooter, and I have, he's shooting, and she's shooting. Who's my bad guy when I come in? And I'm a nervous cop. Anybody with a gun? So you take a risk, you get a shot. But we'll talk about whether you engage with a firearm or to fight as a group. Uh, we'll talk about that just briefly, because I know we've got other places to go. That's one of the reasons I gave you a card. On the back of those cards has my cell number. You're welcome to call uh, for more extended conversations uh, or if you just need help in county government. When you talk about engaging a target, you have to be within your capacity, your capability with, of your training and whatever you're carrying for a weapon. Even if you're not carrying a weapon, can you do what you're going to plan to do with your body strength or the training you have in self-defense? That's the decision you have to make. There's no duty under Texas law to defend a third party. You can, in Texas law, you can defend a third party against the use of deadly force without their permission. Uh, but you don't have a duty to protect them. Now, I don't know too many people, if you are in charge of a class of six-year-olds, that would abandon the six-year-olds and then you would go to safety. I don't know too many people who would leave some nutcase uh, in a theater shooting unarmed people in a theater when I ha when you had the capability of resisting. But then you have to talk about what can you do for resistance. What are you carrying? What are you capable of in low light? What about that smoke situation? Uh, I am always on the top row. I have nothing behind me. I do that deliberately because I want, number one, I want that clear range on the side. I want an easy exit if I want to go over the side with the, or send the wife out that way. And behind me is all open seating if I needed to go someplace for additional cover. 
I would not, with a handgun, be very good at shooting at somebody who's down at the very front of the theater. Now, most likely, I'll have a fairly clear shot because everybody else can be on the ground. I may have people panicking going to the sides. It depends on where the shooter is at. And I do have a cheater on this one. I have a laser sight. Uh, so I have, I call it my old man sight. Uh, so I could probably use it successfully. But if I was using a standard weapon with iron sights, uh, I probably would not take my chances from a distance. Now, that could change. If this person has already killed 12 people and he's shooting as fast as he can, yeah, I'm going to take my chance and take my best shot. I'm going to compensate and I'm going to try to take him out. Same thing for you, but what are you carrying for a weapon? And if you're carrying a Taurus 738, which is one of my favorite little backup guns, it's a 380, it's about the size of your palm here, it carries seven rounds. It's only really, it's very effective in the distances that we're talking right now, and that's by instinctive shooting, which is something that you want to learn, by the way, get away from aim fire. Instinctive shooting is something that uh, you'll find a lot of the manufacturers are taking the sights off of their pocket guns, because that's not how we shoot in close-in situations. And in close-in situations, instinctive shooting is you imprint your weapon over the target, and if that occurs, you're going to hit the target most every time, up to about 30 feet. So you have to make a decision if you're going to engage somebody. Now we're talking about law enforcement response. Law enforcement response, they're going to be on the way, but it's going to be confused. Uh, I'm going to, I didn't want to play the audio because I'm not sure if the people out here will be able to overhear. But basically, we have fancy radios. These have several hundred channels on there. Every, every agency you think of I can get on from the airport, San Antonio Police, the surrounding agencies. Guess what? I can only transmit and receive on one channel at a time. If we had a shooting here, everybody responding would be on the same channel. So if there's a wounded officer, which often happens, uh, and he's talking too much, I've been shot, I've been shot, get me help, I need bit He's blabbering for 15 or 20 seconds, and Officer Bush is trying to tell him, hey, the shooter has moved from theater nine to the lobby, well that's some critical information that we would like to have, but if I'm blathering on about my injuries and tying up that one radio channel, that information may be too late coming out later on. Does that make sense? Uh, so you know, we can't count on the police response being coherent or focused because that may, that's very likely not the case. Uh, when you are, if you do engage somebody inside, let's say we have three or four people, I do call it the firing squad, uh, with the number of people that have concealed carry in Texas, I fully expect I'll probably come in on an active shooter situation and find a defeated active shooter with the number of people who are carrying inside. I'd be surprised otherwise. But let's say it's still going on. When law enforcement arrives, they're going to be dressed like I am or they're going to be in tactical gear. They're going to be making plenty of noise. They're going to have flashlights. The lights should be coming on. You should be able to recognize them fairly easily. Holster that thing. Take cover, let them finish the engagement because they will already figure out who the bad guy is. Uh, and then after it's all over with and they say, everybody come out, come out with your hands up in the air. As you walk out and they ask you, you know, are you all right? You tell them, I'm all right, I'm also carrying. I'm a licensed carrier. They'll handcuff you. They'll take you out and confirm who you are because what would be the great way to escape if you're a crook? Come in, three of us go in with Glocks, two magazines each. We come in, we expend everything we got immediately and then we throw the guns down and we walk out with the crowd and we walk out with the walking wounded. And then next week we'll go do it in Seguin. Uh, because who's going to be able to identify us? Odds are probably not too many people will be able to under those circumstances. Any questions so far? We've covered the basics. Uh, we want to avoid, run. We want to hide if we have that opportunity. If we're hiding, we want to find someplace that's got cover, which is something that protects you from bullet fire, uh, from gunfire itself, and as well conceals you. Uh, if you're running out in the parking lot, uh, the distances you need to be to be safe with a handgun is over 50 feet. Uh, if you're going to hide behind a car, hide behind the engine block and the front wheels. Protects you from ricochets. Uh, you don't want to be flat on the ground on a hard surface because ricochets will travel two to six inches parallel to the surface that they're fired at. And if you're laying flat on the ground, you may get shot in the temple, you may get shot in the body. We need to tell people to go to their elbows and to their knees. If you're dodging rifles, it's more important you get to cover immediately, whether it's a masonry wall, uh, a bar ditch, drainage ditch, break off from the group, let them continue shooting at the group, and you find that protection off the side. And then if the guy's attention turns to security or police forces, then you get run a little bit further. Uh, if, you're, if you're a 22-inch person, don't try to hide behind a 6-inch tree. Uh, being way back in the woods might be a good idea, and behind a lot of rocks, uh, but don't count on something that's not wider than you are. Uh, in an emergency, 
a four inch curb is better cover than nothing if you're caught out in the open. So hopefully we were, we've raised, raised your awareness as to what kind of threats you could face, kept it in perspective as to what you might face. Uh, we we'll usually get some questions on type of weapons down the line and liability, and I'll let you ask if you have any questions. Some of you may have other places to be, and if, if it's true, then you tell me that you're out of time, <coughs> and then you can just give me a call and I'll answer those questions for you. It makes no difference if you're in Bear County or not, it doesn't make a difference if you're in Precinct 3. If you got a question, I can answer it, or if I can find somebody to answer it, just call me and I will get you to the right person. Any questions? In the back. Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> You mentioned Aurora, Colorado. I read that there was about seven or eight theaters, and the theater where the shooting took place, the killing, was the only one that had, you know, uh, a zone free, you know, gun free zone. So, do we have places like that here in San Antonio? I'm from San Jose, California. Okay, I'm from that. I, I've heard that too, that of the theaters in the area, that one was posted as a gun-free zone. I just go back on my statistics, about 80 to 85% of all these shootings occur in gun-free areas. To me, it's uh, like inviting trouble. Uh, if I go here and she's got, you know, it says license, uh, LTC friendly, license to carry friendly, uh, license to carry friendly, license to carry friendly, 06, 07 signs. Where am I going to go if I want to kill people? I'm going to come to the 06, 07 signs. Uh, we put a great deal of trust in people all the time with deadly weapons. You do it every day of your life. I don't know why you have a problem with firearms. And the deadly weapons are cars. We drive all day long. When you drive out here, that's why we expect it. Everybody follows a set of rules most of the time. And that's why we get so angry sometimes when they don't follow the rules, because it's kind of an understood contract between us. Uh, most people, who, not all people who are licensed to carry are trustworthy. They, a small percentage of them get into trouble every year, but it's a very, it's a much smaller segment of society than uh, than general society at large. Uh, to me, a gun-free zone is just asking for it. What are the gun-free zones now? <coughs> They've been limited. Have, have they, something's changed. They, they, they have changed. You still can't carry technically in a in a, a uh, church or a synagogue, although in my church they do. <laughs> I've read up on the law, and if you go from the part, spot that it says about churches, if you go down several paragraphs, it says it has to be posted, a 306 sign. Yeah. If it's not, so if it's not posted? If, if you don't have to see a 306, a 307, or a 51%. Yeah, and it has to be the exact signs as posted. They can't use the red circle with a hash mark through a well, picture. 306, it's only this big. Right. It's actually going to be at least a 30 by 30 inch sign with one inch contrasting letters in English and Spanish. It has to exactly meet the requirements. However, a property owner can ask you to leave in any case, and then at which case you have to leave. By the way, uh, it has to be in a prominent location. You can't walk into a complex and then you go into the restroom and you see the 30 out 6 and out 7 signs in the bathroom falls. That doesn't count. It has to be posted prominently at any entrance to the facility where it's not valid. And as an example with theaters, I've noticed the Regal theaters are all posted 3006 and 3007. Really? Where Santique is with 3007 only. Yeah. And my response to any place that's gun free is I'll take my business elsewhere. Yes. And with mainly churches, excuse me, it's mainly churches and schools. But, but if you're doing a pickup with your kid, you're driving through, and you've got a weapon in the in the drive-through <coughs> areas, you're safe on that. You just can't carry. Now, by the way, people have asked me, what if I go to my school and a kid is a shooting at my kid's school, and I take my weapon out and I go defend somebody? Well, you've committed a, a violation of the law. But if you are the guy who solves this problem, I think that they're probably going to look at mm -hmm. you. I don't think even our DA would come there and say. I've hey, actually heard job. him speak before, where he said, if you, even if you have it where you're not supposed to, and you save lives. He's very likely not going to file charges on it. Yeah. Like the soldier at the recruiting station. Yes. <laughs> and the other areas are sporting events or, or any kind of high school games, you know, those kind of locations. If you go to Combiner Stadium, that kind of place, you're not supposed to carry there. Uh, other than that, the, the legislature has deliberately opened the uh, concealed and open carry. If you come to Precinct 3, you can't carry in a courtroom. But the courtroom and counsel's office are separate. Now, we have no 06 and 07 signs on our side of the building. We have gun boxes. So if you have to have business with the court, come over to the pre-consul's office. We'll take your, you'll put your gun in a gun box. We'll take your, your court business. Come back, rearm, 
So go back out about your business, protect it. Any other questions? Are you saying during I've only seen two people on open carry and they're making a statement because they could. And I, I, I've I'm, seen one. That's it. One person. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Uh, I, I lived in Colorado years ago and uh, that's a, that's a constant, uh, they're open carry, constitutional carry, I believe now. I think they always been constitutional carry. Uh, and we're moving towards constitutional carry here in Texas. That's my belief. Now, what does that mean? Means that we don't have Everywhere? that. Everywhere? Means that your permit no. is the Second Amendment. Yeah, because it, it, it goes back to the definition of what's an inalienable right. Mm -hmm. If it's an inalienable right, then what mm -hmm. right does government have to regulate it? Mm -hmm. uh, which. So we have to pass a law to do that? Yeah, it's kind of odd that we have to do that, but that's where it has to be. We have to bring it back to that point. What, what are you going to do uh, if, um, under this administration, they come and want everybody here in the nation to register their guns? What's the position going to be here in Texas? Well, I don't know what the position in Texas will be, but I know who will have to go out and confiscate the weapons, and that'll be the police. Mm -hmm. And I will dutifully carry out my duty. Every day I will go out with a list, and I will come back every day and say I couldn't find one gun. <laughs> <laughs> People have asked me if a license to carry is a, a, a lead in to confiscation. It doesn't necessarily tie you to a specific weapon, although they probably are going to figure out that you're a gun owner. Uh, registration or registration is usually only valid. The only time you do it is if you buy from a gun dealer. That registration will be with that weapon, but if I buy it and then I sell it second hand to you and you sell it to her and then she sells it to uh, Linda, there's no record of the intermediate transfers. And if they wanted to find out, they would have to come, Mark, what would you do with that gun? Well, I sold it, but I don't remember to who. There's no requirement to re-register a firearm in Texas. Mm. Okay. Uh, and although, you know, unless it's on the insurance registry, which I'm, you know, we're losing privacy on all areas right now. Uh, so what happens if that gun ultimately is used for a crime and they come looking at you because you're the original purchaser of the gun? I would have no liability on it. Uh, I would, if I sit there and tell myself, well, I sold that gun like five years ago. I had a, uh, I actually had a car one time that showed up in Austin with a body in the trunk. And they asked me about nice. it and said, I don't know, I sold the car five years ago, I have no idea about it. So they did come by to check, of course, and that would be the same thing if a firearm was used in a crime, but uh, odds are, you know, you transfer it lawfully. Uh, I have people call and ask all the time if I sell some, the, the gun to somebody or if I'm buying a gun for somebody, uh, and you're buying it on the street, I tell people to give me a call, I'll run it, I'll see if it's stolen, I'll let you know if it's stolen or not. Uh, I don't know of any law that that violates, and it's a protection. I don't keep a record of what you ask, uh, unless they come up with a new law by presidential order that you know, we need to line up someplace and have our guns inspected. Okay. Well, we're talking about the shooter, the shooter, active shooter, mm -hmm. but that that's kind of assumes that um, we weren't able to keep him from accessing the space with a gun. Right. It, you know, but, but there's things to be done so that they cannot access the space with the gun. The question is, uh, if reactive shooter assumes that we have failed in keeping them out from accessing the space. The problem is, uh, most public buildings, most schools, uh, there is no way to really secure them. I mean, you could, you could do it by brute force, uh, but like for example, this school that has 64 acres, they have four or five roads that enter, uh, there's six or eight parking lots, uh, there's no sense. The, the campus is actually distributed. They have an elementary school, a middle school, and all the schools are outside. It would be impossible to funnel people through, like a central checkpoint. Uh, even locations like uh, the Bear County Courthouse, uh, I used to be in charge of security there. And uh, my job on court security exercises, we were teaching other people about court security, and they would come up with a scenario with uh, they were with. Criminal, criminal street gang, for example, and they were going to try to free a prisoner. And then they would put their security in place, and my job was to defeat that security. I defeated it every time without any problem at all. I, I, there's nothing. You give me TSA all day long, and I'll walk past them every day of the week. Uh, same thing about security in most places, in places that exist in courthouses and that kind of thing. Those are feel good measures. They don't really do any real protection. They'd be better off letting citizens carry guns in there. I walked onto a high school campus several years ago looking for the office. And campus was under construction. I spent 15 minutes walking around the campus with a duffel bag in my hand and never got challenged by a staff member. 
But two weeks later, I spoke with the principal about it, and they sent out a memo that afternoon that everyone without an ID pad would be, would be challenged. He was not happy. Yep. All I was doing, I had to drop off clothes for my daughter. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, what I'm saying is that, like in a movie theater, like because uh, in a school it's different. Mm -hmm. but they're supposed to have guards in the school. They're responsible for the students. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. Most of them don't. Uh, I know, but I mean that's what I have to say about it. But in the cinema, you open that exit door, you you block it so it doesn't close. You go get your gun, you come back in. Mm -hmm. I mean that that's that's a stupid system. It should be. They should have an alarm system that says this, this door has been popped open. Uh, but then that's what private businesses have to do. Uh, if, I can, if I design a security system to eliminate weapons, number one, it would be a huge line for those 3,000 people trying to clear security. Can you imagine airline type security for a movie theater? I mean, take off your shoes, take off your belt. That, you know, pretty soon movie theaters will be out of business. Uh, it's, it's just not really practical to a large degree. Uh, and then on the front end, trying to prevent people from getting guns that don't, 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 don't should not have guns, uh, keeping the Second Amendment in mind is a tough, tough measure. Uh, what do you use? I mean, we already have people, doctors asking, do you have guns in the house? None of your business. The doctor asked me that. Uh, you know, are you under, if, if you are under treatment and they, have, they provide you a, uh, something that's to help you sleep at night, uh, but it can also be medicine used to treat mental illness, if that goes in your records, technically that can cause you to where you flay out the firearms check where you will not be able to get a weapon. It's subject to a lot of misuse. If our president had a choice, you'd have everybody on the no-fly list ineligible to buy a gun, and those, that list is notoriously inaccurate. So it's, it's a tough situation. Right now, the most I've seen theaters do is add a cop outside and a cop inside, which if you've got 4,000 visitors, that's pretty thin security. Because it's a dark space also. Right. And also, well, all they, all they have to do is get a volunteer to be at the exit doors while people are coming yep. in. Some kind of system like that. But uh, right now, there's even one theater here that is, uh, you're not supposed to take a gun in there, it's posted. Yeah. Santicos doesn't bar firearms from coming in. They have, uh, I haven't even seen open carry, Taco Cabana has a very tiny little sign that says if you're open carrying, we prefer you conceal while you come inside. You know, if they ask you to do that, take your t-shirt out over it. Uh, and where we have had open carry and concealed carry and the numbers grow, usually the incidence of violence goes down because you want to be going into a situation where you walk into that theater knowing that another 35 people in that room may be armed as well or better than you are. Yes, sir. Should we uh, become, uh, you know, I've done uh, church security for years back in California, and I was always a profiler, mm -hmm. you know, always check people, the way they look and so on like that, especially one time when someone was getting out of jail and we worried about him coming to harm our pastor, you know, and the guy came in, mm -hmm. and I alerted him, but he, he didn't do anything, okay, but still, you have to look at people and and make a decision about them, right? Exactly, and you have to profile. make your best guess. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that may not be good enough. Yeah. Uh, if you remember the uh, biker shootings in Waco, uh, the week following that, my church had a plan. They had invited the outlaw biker gangs to come for a blessing of the bikes at our church. Yeah. Five days earlier, they just had this shooting, and they were asking me, should we conduct this event? So we have contacts with all the local gangs, and we were asking, is anybody looking for revenge? Is there a problem? Because if they said they put it in our hands, they said, well, if you think that it's going to be too dangerous, then we'll cancel it. Uh, we went through all of our sources and all of our intel sources, and it looked like <coughs> okay to have that event, so we did. But I guarantee you, you had a, a lot of green uniforms hiding out in the bushes, guys on the roof with long guns. Uh, the church never knew it. Uh, they knew it after the fact. Uh, but they never knew what they had uh, until we let them know what we actually put out there, just in case. Uh, all my officers are trained on that, by the way, tactically. We were criticized with it constantly. Uh, we, we, we absolutely hope that you never have to use this kind of information personally. Our officers go out every day hoping to patrol Mayberry, but at the same time, we're prepared to patrol in a wartime environment. And when I say that, we have a tactical response unit in our constable's office. Every officer is trained tactically. Every officer has a long gun. 
an AR platform with at least four mags. Every officer has a lethal shotgun with double up buck and slugs. Every supervisor's vehicle carries a less than lethal shotgun, which is a, we call it a green gun because we paint the forearms green and those fire uh, beanbag rounds so we can take out people who are with a knife at a distance or are mentally ill. We run across that often. Uh, and then everybody who is in the tactical, who is on the entry team or is a dog handler carries an MP5. And then I have county commissioners who have never carried a gun a day in their lives and never been shot at telling me we don't need to carry backup guns. So that's one of the things you get to do when you're in a, in a governmental position. <laughs> you don't need those. Okay, I'll buy it from asset forfeiture. You're elected, right? I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, they're elected too, and that's why we always try to point it out to them all the time. They uh, can't fire you. They can't, but they can make it miserable on my budget, uh -huh. and that's their control once per year. But most of the time, most people don't even know who they are, and I love the they. And that's always been our greatest enemy is they. Any other questions? What about grenades? Grenades, we didn't talk about explosives, but they are, their explosives have been used. Uh, the vest belts for explosives have been used. I've actually seen the results of four or five of those myself directly. I have pictures that we can't release when I was in Iraq. Uh, they are using vest bombs and they are using hand grenades. It's not that hard to get through here. Well, to go through it, how do you defend against all those things would take more time we have here. The simplest question is if a grenade lands right here, best thing to do is fall away from the grenade, go straight to the ground, bring your uh, knees back up against your butt, protect in the back of your head so your legs are kind of standing up as a something between you and shrapnel, so it doesn't get you in the back of the neck or the back of the head. Uh, the blast of an explosive device goes all directions equally, and shrapnel goes up in a cone. So if you're uh, a, you may be killed by the concussion if you're real close to it. If you're further away, it's going to be shrapnel, and at a distance in the back there, you're going to be fine if you're laying on the ground, and you, wanna, you don't want to be facing the explosion because if that low-end shrapnel or something ricochets come back down to you, you get a secondary, you'd be killed off of that. But they're coming in with the vest bombs. That's why we talk about not having a detonator in your hand. Because uh, can you imagine doing that in a crowded theater? That's got to be somebody who's willing to take their own life at the same time. Uh, where they're showing more small unit tactics now where they're going to come in, attack, and then they try to escape, or they take their own lives. The, the uh, nutcases, they intend to die. Some of the ideological may want to try again another day. Anything else? He's running. He's running for re-election. Uh -huh. yeah. I'll go for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you ask? I'll, I'll, I'll take a seat. If you have anything else, if you have questions, I'll be here while you finish up your meeting. Uh, and if not, you all have a phone number. You're welcome to give me a call, whether you're in Bear County or not. Uh, and we can talk tactics on guns, uh, type of weapons to carry if you're not carrying concealed. Uh, one of my, it's one of my favorite is the Taurus 738-380. Palm size gun takes about 14 pounds of very deliberate pressure. Uh, the real guns that are worthwhile don't have don't have safeties. Guns are dangerous by design. You should know how to handle them. The operator is a safety, and then use a pre or a uh, frangible ammunition. Uh, Corbon or the blaster safety slugs are extremely efficient, uh, especially if you don't want to go through both sides of the wall in your house for like, your kids, other people in the house. But they're very effective on fairly heavy clothing and into the person without going through them and going into injuring the third party. Thank you, Mark. Thank you And that's what I was. I asked Mark what was in line earlier. Can I embarrass you tonight? You guys, elections start in the morning. This is a kid. He's not out working for himself tonight. He's out working for us. And I, I just really wanted to bring that up. You really impressed me. Thank you. you really do. You guys, I hope y'all remember Mark when you go to vote. <laughs>